And the people of the Lord said, amen. God bless you guys for leading us in worship. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. Every day, I talked to somebody this morning. They said, man, it's just a great day to be alive, and it's a great day to be in here in church, and a great day to be celebrating. We're glad to have uh, GH back safely with us. Glad you had a great time with the grandkids. I think God's blessing is giving us grandkids for not killing our children, but then at the same time, we can shake them up and head them, get them back and get back home where it's nice and quiet. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, good to have each of you with us. And, and I just want to shout out to those who are still watching online at home. We still have 30 to 40% of our folks every week that are still watching from home. And so we will continue to be a hybrid church and where we can celebrate here. But know that we have people literally all over the country and sometimes all over the world that are worshiping with us right now. And I don't know about you, but that excites me because we have all gathered electronically or here in person, but we're worshiping the same holy God who is worthy of our praise. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Well, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, we have launched into a series entitled Different. Many times as Christians, we want salvation but sometimes we forget that we're supposed to be disciples and we're supposed to be followers of Christ. And so as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are called to be different. We're called to think, to act, respond differently than the rest of the world. Saying I'm a Christian is easy. Living like one can be very challenging. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. So we're going to take a look at, uh, continue in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew with chapter 5. Going to be reading verses 1 through 12. And if you remember as you're reading, and here's what my hope and prayer is, is that as we're going through this series, and I've never really done this before because I think I'm ADD and I'm afraid everybody else is ADD at the same time. And so we do hits and misses and, you know, we keep going and, and going through different series and all that kind of stuff. And I think God just wanted me to slow down and he wanted y'all to come on the journey with me. And so we're going to be going through the Gospel of Matthew. Now, some of you love coming to church. You love hearing the word because it makes more sense when you hear somebody else say it. Sometimes when you're at home, it can be challenging. It's like, I don't know what that means. Well, thank God for Google. You can take a look and you can find different uh, commentaries and different people that help you. But I also remind you that the more you read, the better I sound, right? Because you're making immediate connections and you know what I'm saying is not my words, but what comes from the scripture itself. So Matthew has recorded this down. Obviously, he must have raised his hand early and said, um, Jesus, will this be on the test, right? Because he has written this down and he has recorded it. It's the longest sermon that we have recorded from Jesus and it's also the most powerful John Stott, one of the famous commentators, said that it's also the most misunderstood and the least followed. Ooh, yeah. And so today we're going to just take a look at it and kind of dig in a little bit. And, and, and what is he really trying to say to us? But my prayer is that for every one of you would be asking that question, God, what do you want from me? Too many times we make worship about us and what we like. And yet it's time for us to take a step back, to pause and say, God, what do you want for me? And what do you want from me? How are you calling me to be different? So Jesus has started his calling of his disciples. Those are the ones who are going to be the closest with him. But as he's going around and he's starting his ministry, he's, he's been preaching, he's been teaching, he's been healing. And can you not imagine that people don't really know who he is because many of them knew where he grew up. They knew his family. Even his brothers and his sisters didn't really believe that he was the Christ. Andy Stanley keeps asking the question, what would it take to convince you that your brother was Jesus the Christ, right? It's going to, well, it's going to take a lot. For James, the brother of Jesus, you know what it took? The crucifixion 
and the resurrection of his brother. And it changed everything. From the moment he saw his brother alive again, it changed his heart, it changed his mind, it changed his way of thinking. And that's exactly what, what Jesus wants from us. Now, as he's preaching and teaching and healing, and you can imagine people are getting excited about it because he's healing them from sicknesses. He's healing them from diseases. He's healing them from lifelong deformities. The dumb can speak, the lame can walk. He even feeds them lunch, right? And calls somebody back from the dead. So there's a lot of people that get on the Jesus train and they're going, woohoo, watch Jesus because he makes your life better now. You know anybody? Maybe one day it was you. <laughs> Says, well, I'm a Christian. Ah, I just don't go into all that church stuff. And I want you to think about that because first, my response to everybody is if you're truly a Christian, if you truly get it, if you truly understand it, then is not God worthy of our praise? Sometimes we get mad at God because we have challenges in our life. We have suffering. Our choir just saying about the, the beauty of the old rugged cross. And sometimes we get mad when God doesn't save us from the trials of life. But do you not know and understand that through Jesus Christ, the only way that we could be with God came through the suffering of Jesus Christ. When his people were in, in, in Egypt and, and they were slaves in Egypt, get this, for 400 years. How many of you are older than 400 years? Anybody? I got one. <laughs> 400 years. And I, and I just wondered what it was like to be a God person, to be one of the Jews that was in slavery and saying, how come God doesn't answer my prayer? How come we get tested more and more and more? And then when God sent a deliverer, it actually got tougher. It got more difficult. And so you can imagine that when they were finally delivered, but listen to this, he didn't take the straightest route to go into the land, the promised land. He took the long way around. He took them through suffering because the important thing is he's not here to relieve suffering. He is here to make a connection with his people. If you're out in the desert and you're saying, God, where are you? It's there when he meets us. But today our passage is called the Beatitudes. And if you don't know what that means, it means what your, ought, your attitude ought to be. Beatitude. But the root word behind it is actually called blessing. Anybody want to be blessed this morning? Six. Fantastic. I'll preach to you then. Now, we all want to be blessed. Let's take a look at what Jesus says. Now, the, the last thing I want to say about this part is pay attention to whom he's talking because the crowds are growing. You can imagine there's thousands. And yet, when he sees the crowd, and I believe his heart was already breaking because there are some people who only want to know what have you done for me lately? They're there for the shock and awe. They're there for the miracles. They're there for the power. They want Jesus to be Savior, but not Lord. And what he's doing is he's calling his disciples to come together. And so he goes up on a hillside, and many of you, as have I, have been there on this hillside overlooking the lake or the Sea of Galilee. And pay attention to who comes to listen to him. Now, when, she, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward, great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, so all the people are around, <laughs> but when the preaching starts, people disappear, don't they? They fall out, they go to sleep. No, nope, no, nope, I want to be saved. I want miracles. I want God to do this for me. I want it. But you know, that whole teaching and preaching thing, I don't know. What it says here is that his disciples gathered around him. They hung on his every word. And somebody who is truly saved, who is truly saved, hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of God. In fact, at some point later, when, when Jesus, the teachings get hard. Have you ever been through some kind of training where it's kind of a weed out training, right? Sometimes in the military, they'll make you do all the physical stuff first because some people are like, nope, I'm out. This is too hard. I'm not going to do it. And they just kind of weed it out. Now, for you and I, we would be excited to see thousands coming. Let's do whatever it takes to make people happy so we can get more and more people coming to hear the good news. But this is Jesus saying the rubber meets the road here. It's easy to say, I'm a Christian, but it's hard to do. And in fact, <laughs> hang in there with me for the next few weeks because it's going to get even harder and if you are still hoping that you're good enough to be accepted into heaven, you don't really get it. Because the only way we can go and be with God forever is to be saved through faith, through grace, right? So let's take a look at some of these and let's kind of unpack them a little bit, kind of look at some of the original languages so we can have a, a deeper understanding of what's going on here. In fact, this word blessed means um, to, to have a blessing or promise. The original word here is makarios. You can write that down, M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S if you want to look that up later. Makarios, it means blessed. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I'll just use their initials. Um, but if you, do you know somebody, because I do, that every time you ask them, how are you doing? They answer, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm hearing some chuckling coming from the choir because I don't want to embarrass her at all, but her initials are Glenda Dry. <laughs> Hi, Glenda. God bless you. How are you doing today? You're blessed. Okay, I thought she would say that. Because no matter what's going on inside of her life, she's connected with Jesus. And so no matter what's happening, no matter what challenges, no matter what's going on, every time you ask her, how are you doing? She says, I am blessed. I am blessed. So number one, the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is not about having low self-esteem. There's some people that just struggle that I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. And that's not what we're talking about here. It's talking about spiritually poor and coming to that point of realizing that I cannot save myself. I can't follow the Ten Commandments. I can't follow the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if there's any hope for me. If that's you, good news. God bless you. You get it. You understand because those who are poor in spirit who are not proud, haughty, think they're better than everybody else and they realize it's only by grace are they saved. Here's the blessing. He says the promise, the good news is that you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. 
Now, if you read many different commentaries, you're going to find a lot of different explanations about this one. But the root word that is used here in the Greek is the strongest word found. And it has to do with those who are grieving, mourning for a loved one who has passed away. Anybody ever been there? You just feel this overwhelming sorrow this overwhelming sense of loss. And yet, what does he do? He takes it and says, if you've ever been there before and you come to me and you are my followers, then you know that this world is not all there is. There is another world, a better life that's coming and even the apostle Paul, he says, I don't want you to grieve. And, and you need to understand that many of the teachers, the, the Sadducees, the old joke is they're sad, you see, because they never even believed in an afterlife. They thought this life was everything. And once you die, pfft, you're dead, you're gone. You're, you're nothingness, you're into oblivion. You're just simply gone. How could you possibly feel good about that? But when you understand the grace of Jesus Christ, then even when we mourn because we are separated, we can also be blessed in knowing that this life is not all there is. And for all of those who are in Christ, we will see them again. They're already experiencing the afterlife of being with and seeing God face to face. Blessed are the meek. <laughs> Maybe you've heard many sermons on this one. Meek does not mean weak. Maybe you know the bumper sticker that says, I can't wait for the meek to inherit the earth because then I'll just take it from them. Good luck. <laughs> because it's not we who have a new heaven and a new earth. It is the almighty and powerful God. But he says, if you are meek, and meek does not mean weak. It, it is because Jesus was the meekest of all. It, it's about having a proper understanding of yourself. And it's even a humility. And it's a strength. And, and it's used here quite often of an, animals. If you, if you put a bit in their mouth, the mightiest horse will turn to the left or to the right. Because you can steer them. It, it, it's not that they're weak. It's simply you're harnessing the strength and it's under control. And when we say blessed are the meek, it's because we realize we are out of control. We are actually powerless in ourselves. But when we align ourselves with Jesus Christ, and here's the blessing. When we align ourselves with him, that those who humble themselves before Christ will inherit not this earth. This one's going to be destroyed. If you're hanging on to this earth and you're just trying to make this one better, guess what? It's going away. It's getting burned up. But Revelation tells us there's a new heaven and a new earth that is coming together. And all those who are not just agreeers in Christ, but those who are truly his disciples, those who are truly followers of Christ, will inherit a new earth. Haven't you had some great times here on earth? Man, there's some beautiful places. We, we love seeing our family. We love all, there's many great, but then there's something that's still churning inside of us. It's, saying, it's still not right. We have hope and belief one day. When God comes again, he will come in strength and he will come in power and he will separate and he will create a new heaven and a new earth and everything will be right. Number four is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We see this in the disciples because just like today, um, there are many people who say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. Why? Because it's boring. The preacher talks too long. I don't like the music. Well, I like two of the songs, but I don't like four of the songs. Um, I, I have soccer. I have kids. It's my only day to sleep in. You've probably heard them all. You, you might have used them at some point or another. 
But at this point, when you say there's, there's a hunger and a thirsting, and the root word here is even more. There's an intensity that comes in. It's just not saying hungry, where it's like, hey, have you got a slice of bread? Have you got just a little piece that I can have? It's like, no, it's wanting the whole thing. You have a, a voracious appetite. You are hungering and thirsting for the word of God. And you will do anything, you will go anywhere, you will put up with anything if you say, just give me your words. And that's exactly what Peter was talking about because in a little bit later, we're going to learn that many of the people walked away. They went, that's too hard. Who can do that? In fact, GH, I'm glad you're back. Um, we've already planned the series out and he's going to tell you why you are supposed to be perfect. Whoa. And it's not GH. It's right here. You must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. But he's also going to help us understand what perfect really means. But, but you could see the frustration in the disciples when everybody starts walking away and they're going, it's too much. I got kids at home. I'm paying the babysitter. Uh, we've got soccer practice tomorrow night. I can't follow Jesus. I can't do this. In fact, he's going over the top. I'm starting to believe like many other people that he's just a crazy man. He's just a madman. But the disciples, and when the teaching got hard and, and, and the people started walking away and the disciples were confused. We had thousands and now we've only got a couple. Maybe a few dozen. Maybe a few hundred. Aren't we supposed to be getting big church here? Aren't we supposed to be having finances? Aren't we supposed to do all these things? And Jesus turned to him and he said, do you want to leave too? Do you want to go? Is this too hard for you? And Peter, how many of you love Peter? I love Peter. He made a lot of mistakes, didn't he? But there's something that's so genuine about his heart. And, and he looks at Jesus and he said, where can we go? We've already left everything to follow you. My wife's kind of annoyed. I got kids at home. I'm not fishing. I'm following you. And you're sending them away by the boatloads. But he says, where else can I go? Because you and you Alone, Yeah, this is an exclusive statement. You and you alone, only you have the words and the power of eternal life. Of course, we're going to stick with you. I'm in it for the long haul because I believe you are the Christ. And this righteousness, hunger and thirst for righteousness this is where we're called to be different. We're called to be, think differently, to act differently, to watch different things on TV, to go different places, to dress differently from the rest of the world. The world does what's right in their own eyes. There's a scripture that even talks about that later toward the end of the New Testament. And, and it says that people will only want that which tickles their ears. But the righteousness that's talked about here is the righteousness of God. If there is a moral law, there is a moral law giver and we don't have the right to change it. For anybody, for anything, it's not we who are explaining to God how it ought to be. It's has God explaining how it ought to be and we conform ourselves to him. We don't get him to conform our, himself to us. And sometimes even we who say we are Christians and Christ followers, in order to make ourselves and everybody else feel more comfortable, we've adjusted our theology instead of adjusting our lives. Righteousness does not come from doing what you think is right. It's knowing there's an almighty creator God who loves you who cares about you who's desperately trying to show you how to live your best life ever but it's he who has given us the moral law and it's up to us to adjust our lives to come in line with him and here's the promise for all those who hunger and thirst 
For those who just can't get enough, you can't get enough Bible studies, you, you can't spend enough time in prayer, you can't in devotion, you can't get enough out of church, you want more and more and more. It says, for those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, like King David, your cup will be filled to overflowing. Not just a sip, not just a little bite, it's everything, it's filling us up from the inside out. Number five is blessed are the merciful. Now, this, the Greek word actually goes back to the Hebrew word is, and, and it's chesed or chesed or something along that line, all right? There's a whole lot of guttural stuff in there. And it's more than just saying, now, now, <laughs> patting other people on the head and saying, you know, it's tough to be you, isn't it? But I'm, I feel so sorry for you. No, it said, blessed are the merciful and the word that is used here and this is kind of gross, okay? But it, you'll see the word picture. when It is literally climbing inside the skin of another person. What is it like to be them? What is it like to, to feel the things, to experience what they're going through? And because of that, we have compassion we have mercy. And what does it say here? Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Number six is blessed are the pure in heart. The Greek word here is uh, katharos, and it's where we get the word cathartic from. Have you ever had a cathartic? If you come home from a long day and your husband or wife are standing there, well, honey, how was your day? And you just kind of go, bleh, right? Right? That, that's, that's catharsis. You're just getting it all out. God bless you. Some of you have a gift, and no matter who it is, wherever you're standing, you just get it all out. Whatever you're thinking on the inside, you just get it all out. That's the word here, this catharsis. But it also means an emptying, a cleansing, being unmixed. What happens when you wear your clothes too long? or maybe to one dinner. <laughs> you get food on it, right? You get stains on it. What do you have to do? You have to throw it in the washing machine because you want to get the stain out. Is that not exactly what he's saying here is that we need to be pure in heart. We have to get our stains out. We all have the blot of sin and stain in ourselves, in our bodies. But when we give our lives to Christ, then we can be emptied of ourselves, our wants, our will, our way, our sinfulness, and become pure in heart. This is a call for self-examination. Some of us are still mixed. We want to live with one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. I can't go any farther than this. But you get the picture. It is we're trying to balance it. Anybody ever tried to step off a moving boat onto a dock? I'm not looking at my wife. Been there, done that. Because the first person usually steps off, but what are they doing? They're pushing off with their other foot. You end up doing a split, right? And maybe getting wet. And that's exactly what happens. It's not good news when you try to step off. When you try to keep one foot on dry land and one foot on a moving boat, it doesn't end well. And so we have to come back and be unmixed in our relationship with God and say, God, I open up my heart cleanse me I don't want to be confused anymore I don't want to be mixed anymore I don't want to have the struggle of sin in my life anymore the stain I want to be cleansed before you and here's the promise and is this not what we're all working for and all we want it says those will see God, if you are unmixed in your devotion toward God, here's the promise. No matter what you're going through right now, you can get through it because at the end of the day, God's gonna make everything right. And for those who are unmixed in their relationship with him, 
they will see God. All right, number seven, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's shalom. Um, if it, in the Greek, it's irene. And it's not just being, some of you are peacemakers. <laughs> There's usually one in every home. Let's just keep the peace. Everybody be nice. Everybody retreat to your corners. You know, let's just kind of, and, and, and some of us, think this means peace at any cost just just whatever it takes to get along with everybody else it's it's all okay but there's something here that you need to know and to understand it is not just peace at any price or peace that goes it's helping people and others be at peace with God and sometimes we as Christians we're not called to judge everybody And certainly not called to judge the world, but sometimes we are called to come alongside a brother or sister in Christ that said we're not to judge, but we are called to be fruit inspectors. And sometimes we have a brother or a sister that is having a particular struggle and we just don't keep the peace by not saying anything because we can see them getting sin as hamartia. It's getting farther, it's missing the mark. It's getting farther and farther away from God. So as like, like shepherds, like brothers and sisters in Christ, we come alongside of them and say, you're heading the wrong way. I love you, God bless you. But you need to make this right and you gotta get right with God. That's what we say, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be sons of God. Can you imagine being claimed by God? Can you imagine seeing God face to face? Can you imagine when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan with John the Baptist and coming out of the water, the Holy Spirit spoke in such a way that everybody heard it and said, this is my son with whom I will please. Listen to him, listen to him. Number eight, blessed are the persecuted. Somebody say retro. <laughs> right? We don't mind having to work or tweak our lives a little bit. We'll, we'll do, we'll try to do a little bit better. We'll try to be a little bit more merciful. We'll try to do that. Uh, we don't want any of that persecuted stuff, right? Because we don't like to suffer. But this is where the rubber meets the road. We are blessed to live in a nation that is free. But I am convinced that we take that freedom for granted. We have many people who are not in church today because they just say, eh, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I walked the aisle. I got sprinked. I got dunked. I got baptized. I don't have to do anything else. It's like you need to read the rest of the whole New Testament, man. That's not what the gospel is. Do you know there are many people who are today, and I haven't seen the statistics recently, but it blew me away when I learned just a few years ago, there were far more martyrs today by far than there were back in the days of Jesus. Every single one of the disciples suffered for their faith. They were persecuted. I ask you a question this morning. How much of a disciple are you really? Are you willing to suffer for your faith? We live in a nation that's free, and I keep getting pressure from a lot of people. Sorry about that. I keep getting a lot of pressure from a lot of people to talk more about politics and wake everybody up and see that our religious freedoms are being taken away slowly by slowly, and we're just kind of rolling along with it, going along with it. But I've heard some pastors say, I can't wait for that to happen because it really begins to separate the wheat from the chaff. If you didn't live in this nation or if this nation changes its laws and we start being persecuted as Christians, would you still be a follower or would you run and hide? Every one of his disciples suffered many of them being martyred. There's only one that we know of that lived to a ripe old age and that was in prison. That was his thanks, being in prison forever and ever. Before the cross, Peter denied Christ 
all the disciples fled at the foot of the cross because they didn't get it, they didn't understand. But after the cross, every one of them died a martyr. And what is the blessing here? He's like, man, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake because yours is the kingdom of heaven. You should rejoice when you're persecuted for my name's sake. Are you a disciple? Do you truly hunger and thirst for Christ? Can you get enough of his word? Do you wish the preaching would just go on and on and on? Not so much, not ready yet, okay. <laughs> Are you mixed in your desires for good things from this world or good things in the next? Are you really different from the rest of the world? My invitation is just to get right, to get real before God because the, only the Holy Spirit can show us the places where we still need to grow. I heard this recently that said, nobody ever gives their life to Christ because somebody showed them that they were a sinner. That's coming from the outside. It's a change from the inside out. If you're truly a disciple, you invite God into your life, into your heart, to cleanse you from the inside out. God will reveal, he will purge, he will clean, and give you a new heart, now and forevermore. Amen? Amen, let's pray. God, as we come before you on this day, we confess sometimes we fall asleep in church. Sometimes we are too busy to come to church. Sometimes we don't read the Bible because it's too hard. Sometimes we want to be liked by everybody else. And so we just kind of water down our faith. We water down our theology. We water down your word because we're more concerned about the world than we are about you. Some of us are as one person said, it's, it's like concrete. We are thoroughly mixed up and permanently set. But God, we know that for you, all things are possible. And I pray that as we are opening our hearts to you and your Holy Spirit is coming inside of us, changing us from the inside out, I pray that everyone who is hearing this message today is not thinking about who else needs to be here. This is about me, Lord. It's about my relationship with you. And I pray for each and every one of us that we would be open-hearted, invite you in, and truly, whatever it takes, become just not a nominal Christian, not name only, but truly your disciples, followers, hunger and thirst for your righteousness, no matter whatever it takes, so that we can live a best life here but also for all of eternity. And we thank you for this in Christ's name we pray. And the Lord said, amen.